Hello and welcome to Pitchmasters with me, your host, Danny Fontaine. This episode, I speak to one of my all-time favourite heroes of pitching, Nancy Duarte. Nancy's work has had a huge impact on my career, and to this day, I utilise and teach her Sparkline's techniques for storytelling within IBM. Over the next hour, you'll hear about how Nancy discovered Sparklines, the joy that followed and her moral decision about whether to share it with the world. We talk about speeches and keynotes by Martin Luther King, Steve Jobs, Al Gore and Jawaharlal Nehru. We talk about making presentations like Pixar make movies, humanizing data and how to make your audience feel something. This episode is available in full as a video on Apple Podcasts and YouTube, and you can find all the links in the show notes. Folks, it's another good one. Nancy Duarte, what an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. Now, I am a huge fan of your work, and I'm sure we'll probably get into how much I use it in my daily life. But before I introduce you, I'd love to hear you introduce yourself. How do you pitch oh. yourself to, to an audience who's never heard of your name? Imagine that. <laughs> That's awesome. I, we, uh, how do I introduce myself? Um, I would say I'm a, a passionate about storytelling in business and, and a grandma and a, been married for <laughs> 43 years. Um, if I were to introduce what I do, um, I have a, a gorgeous company that writes and produces and helps you deliver uh, the talk of your life. So we'll either do that for you or teach you how to do it for yourself. So we have two different motions there where we're consultants on the communication side, or we are trainers and facilitators if you want to learn how to do it yourself. Fantastic. And yeah. we'll get into lots of that shortly. But the way I first discovered you was your TED talk about sparklines wow. and it stayed with me forever. And I'm always sending the link to everyone who I come into contact with. You're the reason why it has so many. I'm views. the reason you've got all of those views. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but for, again, for those people who haven't heard of sparklines and haven't seen your TED talk, can you, can we start there? Can you give us an overview of, of what I'm talking about? Yeah. So um, I went on a long journey through storytelling because um, my body of work was originally about the visual display of information. And I started to realize that people started to make better slides, but it was like putting lipstick on a pig. And, and, and there was so many important messages that needed to be told well, and content is king. And so I went on a three-year journey through storytelling, um, trying to figure out what is the difference between people falling asleep in a presentation when, versus when people are sitting and listening to a story be told or in cinema, right? Because the same situation, there's someone in the front of the room talking or you know, a movie happening, but then people in the audience were responding differently. In a presentation, they were falling asleep, but in a, like a movie or a, a, when stories were being told, it was really riveting. And I felt like speeches fell somewhere in between. The really greatest speeches of all time actually aired closer toward uh, cinema, riveting, like your heart races. It, it, it was just so different mm. of an experience mm. than what we were seeing in business as a classic response to how people present. So I went through a whole journey uh, through storytelling and found that the greatest speeches also had a rise and a fall, like an arc to them. It just wasn't one continuous arc. And uh, that was the discovery that I made. And then I used this kind of format and shape that I came up with that's called a sparkline and uh, used it to analyze the greatest speeches of all times. So my TED Talk specifically addresses, I thought, well, if it works for Dr. Martin Luther King, who was like a legend as an orator, and I could use it and apply it to speeches that a really fantastic business communicator did like Steve Jobs, that if it worked for both situations, then I would know what I found was true. And I've analyzed now probably 60 uh, speeches now, and the greatest speeches follow the form. And um, what it does is it has that same rise and fall of tension that a story has, but it uses contrast to do it. So um, I guess the listeners can imagine in their mind's eye, I hate to use this metaphor, but like a 
carved pumpkin teeth. You know, it's like it just undulates up and down in in a very angular fashion. So you um, start by establishing your talk by establishing what is, and and what you're doing there is you're creating a shared narrative, a sh- common ground, establishing your cred- credibility by saying, "Hey, here's the state of how things are." And then when you introduced what could be. What you've done is you've created what would be called like an inciting incident in a, in a sh- book or a movie. That's this moment where the audience gets a little bit out of balance because they're like, boy, that's so different than where we're currently at. It's this what could be state. Then you go back to what is, what could be, what is, what could be as a structural device. And you wind your way all the way through what is, what could be. And then you end uh, with a call to action and then what we call the new bliss, which is an ending. And what you do at the end is you describe what the world looks like with your idea adopted. How does it help human flourishing? How does it solve problems? And it creates the sense of longing for uh, this future you're imagining that your presentation will take your audience to. So um, it was a, it was fun. I mean, it's never really been found before. And uh, so it's really, really fun. I'd like to know about the most. So one of the greatest things we can experience is when we come across a discovery like that, yeah. and we think, well, "I don't know whether anyone's ever mentioned this before, but these patterns exist, and we can use them." And, and, I, and I think it was actually when you overlaid MLK with Steve Jobs that you saw that pattern for the first time. Is that right? Yeah. And do you remember? Can you describe that yeah. moment, of that eureka <laughs> moment, almost? Yeah. Yeah, I, it was like a quest. Like when I first drew it, in fact, I found an old deck. I drew it like a zigzag, right? Because it was really the rise and fall, an arc, an arc, mm. an arc. And then I was like, well, what is the z-axis? The z-axis has to be over time, which means at a moment in time, something shifts and another moment of time, something shifts. And so this moment was so poignant. Um, I, I do have a, a pattern finding mind and a, a math. I, when I was in high school, I always loved the concept of diagramming sentences, which a lot of people don't even know how to do that anymore. But to be able to visualize the construct and, and structure of a sentence, just I loved that. And it helped me understand the parts of speech better. And so I thought, wow, can you do that with the spoken word? Is there a way that there's a pattern for influence? And that was, and I knew story played a part. I knew I had to go on deeply through story because I was already very familiar with presenting and speaking and speeches specifically. So I remember, um, uh, my, I was already an empty nester. And so because that, um, I would go to my office on Saturdays, I would get up at anywhere between four and 6 a.m. Uh, work until 11, just focus, focus thinking time for about two and a half years. Um, and I went through story, storytelling, cinema, screenplay, poetry, like just uh, uh, fairy tales, <laughs> you know, right. went through, um, you know, an actor prepares was, I mean, it was just unbelievable. <laughs> and then I was very much Go, constantly going back to this greatest speeches of all times book I had. And I had another version that even had them on audio. So when I wasn't reading about story, I was listening to these speeches over and over and over and, or reading them. Cause some of them, you know, we don't have recordings of And right, I went into right. the office one Saturday and, and, um, what I would do is work, work, work. And then when I was stuck, I would walk and then I would come back and think and walk. And then I remember, I just remember finding a, the pattern in MLK's speech. And then I whipped out my research of Steve Jobs. And that research is on, <laughs> I'm not a digital native. So I did that research on quarter inch graph paper, believe it or not. It was 20, nice. 25 feet long, just as I, because yeah. it was a 90 minute speech. And so when I tested it uh, against his speech, I realized it was true. And there was this very poignant moment that Saturday in my office where I did, I'm sounds dramatic, but I did kind of fall on my <laughs> knees and felt, felt like, and wow. cried for a second. Cause I felt like this is a lot of responsibility, a lot of responsibility to release something like this because people can influence for good or for evil. So f- next thing I did after I realized it worked for those two speeches is I, I wanted to know if Hitler speeches mapped. So I looked wow. up Goebbels. I looked up Goebbels speeches and they are perfect cadence to this shape. And it was that moment in my office. I had to make this kind of decision. 
like moral, not a moral decision, but kind of in my mind, like, can I release this model knowing it would be used for good and evil? You know, and I thought, you know, I have to believe there's more good than evil in the world. And so it was like this moment I had to make that actual decision. And um, that was like a, that was like a big day in my life. I appreciate you asking. (laughs) It was like a big moment for me. I'll bet, yeah. Yeah. Do you think you've got any control over steering it towards good over evil? Uh, You can't, once something's out there, you can't really control who uses it or not, but I've seen many, many amazing, gorgeous, beautiful, good come out of it. If it's evil, I'll just deny that they're using it. <laughs> just say, I, I cannot confirm or deny. No, we do turn nope. down, like, uh, we do turn down, you know, working with some brand, you know, some brands that cause harm, you know, obvious mm. ones, but, um, but we, but yeah, we just want to keep believing people are good. What's your favorite example of usage that you have been involved in using it for? Oh, interesting. Um, well, I use it. I'm actually working on an internal talk. I use it for my internal talks all the time, personally. Um, and mm. I do the whole process. Like I literally have my main narrative across the top, you know, come up with supporting points. And then I check to make sure it has the right kind of emotional <laughs> contrast. As far as customers go. I love it when, I love it especially when the nonprofits hire us like foundations, like foundations will invest in a lot of social entrepreneurism and, and entrepreneurs. So when these bigger foundations pull together the entrepreneurs they're making bets in, I just feel like it's a bit more alive, right? Because this is the early stage of some of the great, great ideas that are going to change the world for good. Like foundations make bets on social entrepreneurs. And so we love it when, when those groups come through, um, because we get to see early ideas and the passion and the fire around mm. these kind of life changing ideas is fun. I would say that's, that's pretty energizing. Technical question. One that I get when I use spark lines with, with teams. So the basic premise is we want as much contrast as possible, right? Between the current uh-huh. world and therefore the problems that we face in the current world. And this kind of glorious vision of the future. And the question Mm -hmm. that I get all the time is, do we have to start with something that's so negative? Can't we start with that vision of the future? What's your rationale behind, or or do you think we can? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's situational. And that's part Mm. of what, you know, you you only have 18 minutes when you have a TED Talk. (laughs) But um, the reason you're establishing what is, it could be, 20 seconds. Like it it has to do with your credibility. Like, oh, oh, they're knowledgeable. Oh, they know about that. Oh, they've considered that perspective too. This Mm. is going to be interesting. Like if you jump straight to this horizon that you haven't even oriented them to, it could be disorienting. So they don't even know what you're talking about. They don't even know why you're even speaking today. They don't know. Like it doesn't (laughs) have to be this long, elongated what is at all. there are certain situations where you jump right to what could be. And, and those are situations sometimes uh, when you're communicating to the board or the exec team or you're requesting a venture capitalist for money because they already know why you're there. They already know. Mm. They've maybe even assigned like in an executive situation. They know you're there to brief them on a topic, right? And so um, in situations where you're in a meeting with powerful people and they're really bright and they already know your domain, you can start with what could be. So it, it, uh, That's what happens in a lot of times a VC pitch. They're like, take a walk in the shoes of my customer. This is how they wake up. They get it up right here. My product's inserted and it makes humans flourish, right? You almost Mm. start with the new bliss, really. And you have to get through that quickly where it's like, here's how my new technology idea creates human flourishing. Here's, here's where we're at. Here's what I need from you. Like you, you almost um, do it backwards because they Mm. have to see a lot of people. And if you save that great big reveal of how you help human flourishing for the back, 
for the end of it, you're going to get cut off. There's certain situations that are interrupt driven, like venture capital meetings, executive meetings, they're interrupt driven. So you have to plan for that. So you have to structure it a little bit differently because it's more like designing a conversation than, than standing in front of an audience and having complete control until you get through your whole narrative. Now, beyond the shape, which, by the way, I describe as uh, looking like snake on a Nokia 3310. <laughs> <laughs> Just throw that in there for Thanks. you. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, but beyond shape, you, you, it doesn't always work, right, if you just do up, down, up, down, up, down. And I think in, well, I think, I know that in Resonate, you use an example of a presentation that you did to your internal team in 2007 that didn't go very well. You did the big contrast up and down, but I think you, you scared the wits out of them uh, to some extent as well. <laughs> how, do we, how do we not only use that shape to create a compelling story, but how do we know how the content fits across that shape? Mm -hmm. That's a good question because um, when I first published it, it's called a presentation form. And other mm. people, like you, right, start to call a presentation sparkling TM. So I am TMing <laughs> that too. But Good, um, you should do. Yeah. what it is, is if you liken it to um, sonata form. A sonata form has a, in music, classical music, has a three act structure. The middle is called the development, where it builds and rises and falls, rises and falls as an ending. No two sonatas are the same. Like, Mozart and Beethoven's sonatas are very, very different. In fact, the greatest speeches of all time have that rise and fall, but you never noticed it. You never even knew it was there as a structural device. So once I came up with the shape, I could historically analyze the greatest speeches. Well, people ask me like, did Dr. King use your shape and know about it? I'm like, no, I was one years old. How old do you think I am, right? No, he you did not use that. it. I know. <laughs> and so, um, so you can historically analyze things and you can also use it uh, to move forward to make sure you have enough contrast. What I recommend people do instead of like using it to make something is obsess about your audience, decide where you want to move them from, where you want to move them to, make sure everything you build supports that, write it, craft it, shape it, and put a lot of heart and passion into it. And I bet it follows the form automatically. Mm, yeah, you right. can go back. Some sections might be a little longer, some thinner. Rarely is it a perfect cadence. Sometimes you might want to use what could be as almost as like a pow, a punctuation almost, like a rephrase. Dr. King moved back and forth between what is and what could be at the phrase level at the tightest part of his speech. And that's why people call it the I have a dream speech. It was called the fierce urgency of now. It wasn't even called the I, I have a dream. The people called it that because of this back and forth tight sequence in the middle of it. So you just, uh, you could use it to analyze it and it, it shouldn't feel like, hi, I'm going to tell you what is. Now I'm going to move to what could be. That just ruins. Like, yeah, it just destroys how much you have an opportunity to, to immerse people in what you have to say. And if you think about the spoken word as one of the most powerful tools we have. So businesses today spend hundreds of millions in advertising just to get a salesperson sitting across the table in a room with someone. And yeah. then we load that salesperson up with these decks that are just like overdone or like, why are you standing there talking at me instead of, creating these beautiful arcs and conversations. So even one-on-one -on -one in a conversation, you can structure what you're saying through what is, what could be, what is, what could be, new bliss. What is, what could be, new bliss. What is, what could be, 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 new bliss. Like in your mind verbally, you don't need slides. You don't need any. I kept my husband to take out the trash and do errands on the weekend with verbal back and forth <laughs> explaining to him. So it's not... I don't know. I hope that kind of answered your question. <laughs> yeah. So it's persuasive. Yeah. It's persuasive. Yeah, it's an yeah. influence. It's for influence. Yeah. D tell me about the Al Gore presentation. Mm. Yeah. So I, I think you're the only person I know who, who basically won an Oscar for a presentation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oscar for power. I d we did buy ourselves a tiny plastic statue because we didn't actually <laughs> get one for ourselves. Um, yeah, that was an interesting one because he had just joined the board. Well, he, you know, he went on his own journey of the soul, um, came mm. off the boat with the beard and got a lot of <laughs> crap from the media. But that was when he decided what he was going to do 
what, you know, what was Al Gore to Dotto came off the boat and was like, my passion, you know, in the seventies, when I had that 35 millimeter slideshow was global warming. And so he had uh, joined the board at Apple at the time and uh, was encouraged to turn it into a multimedia presentation, but board members can't get goods or services from the brands they serve. So they were the ones, it was Apple's creative services department that introduced us to him. And we worked with him for five years before it was a movie. So people thought the transformation was overnight, but uh, we had a team that would travel where he traveled. We had a team that would um, help with research. We had teams that like you know, just depending on what he needed. So once the whole, and we even scanned in some of the actual original 35 millimeter slides um, and turned a lot of it into um, motion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so then when it became a movie, like we're in the credits and all that, but he was always so generous. Like when he traveled and spoke, he always, he put a slide up of our logo at the end, super generous and, and just was always very supportive. And for being such a powerful leader, it was so funny, the contrast between him as one who uh, would listen, consider, like he'd sit and think and reflect for 20 seconds, consider mm. and adopt most of what we said, or have a clear reason why he wouldn't compared to the 24 year old CEOs we worked at at the time who right. just thought they knew better, right? Don't think they needed to, to defer to the experts. It was just a really fun, um, it was really interesting and good um, process. And then we worked with him for about two years after the movie. And then um, he built a team that does it. So it's, it's amazing. It was an amazing journey. And you applied sparklines through that, or how how did the two things come together in that sense? Theory yeah. and this artistic movie. Yeah. So when we worked with him, only my book Slideology was around, and mm. I was working on Resonate, just studying story and just studying narrative. The movie itself follows a sparkline perfectly, um, and I didn't have. We didn't have. We did the part where he. We did the parts where he was standing in front of his slides doing the slideshow part. We didn't have anything to do with like the story about his sister, the story about his personal right. journey. All of that was done by the movie, but it does follow um, the spark line uh, perfectly as he moves between like who he is, who he was, what this happened to him and how it created this. And we're like, this is the data. This is the data that we want to see changed. So the movie itself um, does do that. The only difference is the um, ending, I would say, in An Inconvenient Truth was more what I would call inconclusive. Uh, it has an inconclusive ending. And Western mm. cultures really love a happy ending. Right? We love yeah. Yeah, yeah. the boy to get the girl or for the world, mm -hmm. for the earth to be healthy. And at the end of that movie, which I don't, I didn't have input in, but I thought it was an interesting way is – is they left the ending to lead you to feel that it was the audience who was going to determine how this would end, right? It made some suggestions like recycle or things like that, but it kind of left you hanging on, uh-oh, we better do something, which I actually thought, yeah. I wouldn't have thought of that, but it actually is powerful. Uh, now Very people powerful. are, now I'm see meeting people who are trying to come up with the documentary that does paint the picture of what the world will look like when, um, when climate change is, you know, mm. clearer. So um, anyway, that's how that all rolled out. There's more to presentations than spark lines, of course. And yeah. you are one of the world's leading experts. You literally take customers who say, we want a presentation and we've got no idea what we're doing. Is that, is that fair sometimes? Mm -hmm. I wonder yeah. if it is. Where, where do you start? Yeah. So um, when you say they have, they have no idea what they want to say, uh, we have had clients like that. We've had boxes of data shipped to us. Just I remember the UN shipped us banker boxes and stuff. It's like, <laughs> find the story in there. And so we've done that. Wow. But usually people that come to us have, a, you know, an idea or they work for a company or they have an event coming up or they kind of at least know what 
uh, needs to happen. But um, yeah, we actually will brainstorm. We have two different processes. Um, one is a little bit more like a sprint process and the other is what we call a full studio process. So our sprint process is we actually will unpack with you. We, we brainstorm and then we um, kind of codify it, align it with our IP and our method. We align it with that. And then you get a storyboard at the end and then you can hire designers to go make your stuff. Like a lot of people have an internal design team. Some don't. But the full studio process is uh, we get together with you or with your execs, like whoever it, are all the stakeholders. We get everyone together. We do a discovery session. We align around the intent. We align around how it's going to be used, who the audience is. Um, and then we decide what it's going to be. My team will go back and shape it. So we take all the pieces that are known and then we insert all the story bits and then we shape it in the shape of a story and we present it back. Sometimes we stand and deliver and present it back to them. Mm. Um, so they understand what we're trying to do. So we, we make presentations the way Pixar makes movies is what we say. So picture, you know, everyone's standing around a story. If it's high stakes, you better believe if you're having 5 million people come to your industry event, which a lot of our clients do, you that's a lot. That's a lot yeah. of that. It's a lot of people watching this high stakes moment. And so, you know, we gather around a storyboard. We ratify the storyboard. We do look and feel mood boards will take specific scenes that are massively important that people just have to get. And we'll make sure they're given the right amount of time to unpack it. A lot of times we'll make bets on where things need to be cinematic. Um, and then we rehearse. We rehearse the people mm -hmm. that need to get up on stage and we make sure they nail the points that the vocal and how they visually use their body, it creates the right emphasis in the right moments. Um, yeah. And so it's like a it is definitely, <laughs> it is a bit more like how Pixar makes movies on that side of the house. And then we have obviously the one I talked about that's a bit more like a sprint. We call it a spark right now. And then the other thing is we'll teach you how to do it yourself. We have training where you learn how to um, think through the audience, um, learn how to create this audience journey map use um, uh, the big idea as um, the guiding post for what you're building, then you uh, build it out using contrast, you add the emotional and analytical appeal, like it's literally you peel it back. And then you can pull out this every time you build a talk, you can pull out this method and map to it. So that's the kind of the three levels is learn to do it yourself. We kind of co-create it with you and the outputs a storyboard or you uh, will make you a presentation the way Pixar makes movies. <laughs> and then there's everything in between. Right. So, yeah, that's a good question. And how do you balance when do you write a script in the process in terms of versus the visuals that you're going to show along with the script? Do you tend to do it all in parallel or do you do one before the other? Yeah, usually we chunk out the structure. So we think of it in chunks. Um, and mm. then when, usually in the first meeting, we pretty much can figure out what are the high stakes moments in the actual talk. And so a lot of times from the first meeting, the design team can go away and conceptualize the, like the peak moments. Um, some people just want bullets. They don't want to be teleprompted. Some people mm -hmm. are fully, fully teleprompted. And when they're teleprompted, we'll put in their things like breathe or pause. We make notes to them so they mm -hmm. know, like, you know, we, there's little, mm, like, typographical ways we can prompt them to move stage left, move stage right, like whatever. Like if I'm telling you right now, if your key stakeholders is sitting in the front right row <laughs> and that's the one person in the entire audience you want to impress or you need to, you know, influence, you might as well deliver the whole talk just to that person. But right. <clears throat> we just work through, we just work through all of that and, um, and rehearse them. And so some of these um, execs are so bright and they know their content so well. Uh, sometimes we'll just insert a laugh. Sometimes it's comedic relief. You know, we'll work with them to just hit the key, key moments. But most of the time they can nail it. On the fly, my creative team, when they hear a rehearsal, they could say things like, hey, um, right here, you need to get really loud. Or right here, move your arms out as wide as you can, because you need to take up as much space. And by the way, if you take this part that you said, and this part you said, and flip them, it'll be funny, like right on the fly, the right. night before the event or the morning of. And it's so amazing to watch these communicators just 
adopt the coaching, nail it right mm-hmm. after. It's really kind of fun. And, and they, we get to know the execs really pretty well. It's like having, you know, Yoda <laughs> come along with you. Um, <laughs> the, the executives, we're like their, their Yoda or their Obi-Wan. Um, helping, you know, make them be successful as the hero in their industries. So they're heroes of industry, these these people. It's just really amazing. Do you ever find that any of them are very nervous and anxious about doing it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, What's... Yeah, I think at first people thought that everything had to be cinematic and they couldn't have like words mm. on the slide. So now that we've convinced them that they shouldn't care about what's going on behind them. They should just look at their comfort mm. monitor. Just ignore what's going behind you on the screen. Um, some of them are really nervous. A lot of leaders come up through analytical, classically engineering, technology, financial kind of positions. And now, you know, everyone wants their leadership team on the stage. So there's certain temperaments that will always be nervous. And what's so interesting to me about it, like my husband, he's so difficult to get in front of an audience or even a small dinner party. <laughs> Once you get him there, he's bright and thoughtful and charming mm. and right. And he knows his stuff. He's just not comfortable on a stage. And so I have found that people who are natural on a stage tend to be careless with their content. People who are right. nervous to be on a stage are very thoughtful in their content. So the better presentations do come from more nervous people. And nervous energy, right. even for people who are comfortable on stage, is actually good if you know how to harness it, right? It, you just have to be able to know how to make bets with it in the right moments to let your energy be amped up or let it be constrained. Um, but anybody who who is nervous on stage can learn how to physiologically change their anxiety um, through, you know, contemplative things. I've been on stage two or three stages where I got really nervous to go out there. And so I always, just in case, have something funny I could watch backstage to just like, you know, there's certain things I've done as coping mechanisms. I tend to sit in the dark. I don't go to the green room because everyone in there's jibber jabbering and it's a cacophony mm, of noises. Trying to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, nah, I can't do that until the talk's done. And so I tend to um, like sit in the corner in the dark backstage and just mm. get to just breathe, you know, or find a quiet place. Um, so everyone is different in what you need. Um, one time I tried to amp myself up because that's what a lot of people do. <sighs> And I got a call from where I presented and they're like, hey, a couple of people in the audience thought you might not be feeling well because your breathing was real heavy. I mean, I'm backstage thinking maybe I'll amp myself up. So I'm, I'm putting my arms in the air, jumping a bit, like, like full on yeah. Tony Robbins or something. And yeah. I get on stage and I'm chuffing in the mic and I don't know, trying to get my breathing back under control. So that was a mistake. But um, everyone has to approach their stage presence the way that makes you show up your best. And we have a, a course called uh, Captivate. It's a coaching cohort too. And we try, it's really kind of, for some people it's emotional, but most people it's very grounding where we, you work through a really quick purpose exercise because if you know your purpose and you're communicating your content from your purpose, it's very grounding, very mm. grounding. And then you forget about the anxiety because you're you're delivering it from a place of personal conviction, which just really changes everything. So um, communicating uh, from a stage needs to kind of come from that place. Yes, I think people forget that sometimes, that yeah. they are actually in front of an audience and doing it as quickly as possible is not yeah. actually going to be the best experience for the audience. Exactly. Even if it feels like the best experience for them. I can't remember where I heard you say it, but I remember you saying somewhere that um, – you talked about having a false ending because mm-hmm. when you don't mm-hmm. have an auto cue, which is mm-hmm. 99% of people in the world who do this stuff, it's hard to get your timing, isn't it? And, and I think yeah. often we, the adrenaline gets us talking mm-hmm. far more than we'd ever anticipated mm-hmm. saying and we go off script and do Tell me about this kind of false ending that you have. Yeah, I love that. So I don't know if you ever watch like rom com, romance comedy, you know, I classic actually, Hallmark yeah. channel or whatever. <laughs> they do these false endings all the time, but or K dramas. I'm totally into those right now. But anyway, I know I have like shallow viewing habits because I. Anyway, I tend oh, to you're do a most good company, don't worry. I tend to do emails like sometimes when I'm watching TV. 
But anyway, um, so what happens is in kind of a classic boy meets girl structure, right? Like the boy meets the girl and it's like, oh my God. And then they go into all these miscommunications and, and problems, right? And then he gets the girl, but he loses her again, but gets her right back. Like it's this false ending. The story would be great, you know. He lost her and then got her again, but they always do this last, oh, no, he might lose again. And then he really gets her, right? So that's a false, like I would call that like a false ending. I had, I thank God I did this. I had a talk I gave at, it's kind of like Ted of India. They're called Ink Talks. And okay. so this was one of the ones I was so nervous at because like literally Deepak Chopra, Chopra and um, James Cameron were in the front row and there was only like 500, 300 people there. It was not a very big audience. So I was already really nervous. I was on incredibly pain meds. I was on cold meds. So I was a bit foggy and it was 13 minutes or instead of my 18. And it was similar content to my TED talk. But because I was speaking in India, I had uh, heavily researched Nehru and he was the prime minister uh, who was there when um, India was freed from British rule. And I had I had to go to the library and get all these insights because it's just not well known what what exactly history was like, what exactly that speech was, what exactly the reaction was to the speech. But I really wanted to know. Anyway, I put all this work into it, knowing I was speaking to an audience Uh that would understand Nehru. And so I chose that one instead of Dr. King. And I had it like I had an arc and then I had it end at, I had it kind of end at Nehru, but then I had this really beautiful new bliss. So I had Nehru little, a little bit of a conclusion. And then I had a way to step up and have a bigger, like more like, whoa, blow me back kind of a conclusion. And because I was on the pain meds, I was going slower. And so literally I'm at 13 and a half minutes and I don't, I haven't done my new bliss and the show, like they do at Ted, she starts to walk up on stage and I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> and so I just ended it right there and, and said like two lines or a line or two so that it didn't, so it, so it looked like it was my ending. And the reason you, you can put a false ending there is if, if you, think it could go long if you don't know your material. And if you know your new bliss well enough, you should be able to end. Um, you should be able to pull it forward and just say an ending right there. Um, and so it's almost like if if you have that last lift, it can be more powerful. It could be more um, of a spectacle, more jaw dropping. Um, um, otherwise, in some ways, having that there is like a I don't know, what do they call the eject button <laughs> on something, right? It's like, oh, eject, eject. Um, yeah. And then it's just like somebody else, like, like, let's say someone else more powerful walks in the room and they want to cut your slot short by 10 minutes. I mean, it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's non-trivial. I spoke at an event in uh, Kalamazoo and it's just this mm -hmm. big event and I love it. Other people do. Guy in front of me was, went long and the organizer was like, Nancy, you're a pro. Can you, can you, can you tighten your ending? And I, I always have one. I always have an ending I can tighten on where I don't have to change my deck. And it doesn't mean I go faster. So as, and then the guy brought me back again to his big event because he appreciated it that I could do that on the fly. Do you approach sales pitching in a different way that you approach doing a speech or a talk on stage? So in a sales situation, you often have an audience that thinks, I am sort of holding my hand to keep some distance between you and me because oh, I, I know yeah. I'm being sold to, whereas an audience <laughs> thinks, oh, with a speech, I love you and I want to hear you do well. I see. You've opted into a speech sometimes. Mm. Yeah. Sales situations are really interesting because if you're doing your, if your website did its job right and your marketing did its job right, by the time a salesperson is talking to someone, they already have had uh, some sort of desire for your goods or services, right? Uh, it There is a, a rare and valuable salesperson who can still claw at dirt and find the big worms, right? So there's a real art to the, the pursuit of people who don't know you. So if you broke those into two different categories of the ones who've already kind of found, they've already cruised through your website, they've already vetted you as a potential person that they want to reach out, a potential company to reach out to or give your email to, that's a little bit different than you know, the people clawing at dirt to find worms. Mm -hmm. In a sales situation, it's it's the same process as all of our IP, which is know your audience. Like right. my team isn't supposed to even ping anyone without 
like looking to see if they've been in the news, look to see what their company, right. look at to see if their company's been in the news, listen to an earnings call, listen to da 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 da, right? Because we, these are we're talking about high stakes moments for these brands. So there's homework you need to do to understand that when you reach out to this person, what kind of pressure are they on? What, what might they need? And at least th- take a little walk in their shoes for a minute and think about them and then, and then get ready in the first call to anticipate what their questions might need be. So it's all in anticipation of that. You know, we will project a visual, like a ground, a visual device that'll help them with a mental model. Um, we will sometimes go through, uh, you know, three, four, five slides if, if it helps um, push the narrative along. Um, but sales calls are, are more like designed narratives or designed conversations. Now, a sales kickoff meeting for the sales team, that's that's a different kind of situation altogether, right? It's mm. internal, getting the teams pumped up. So there's different things. There is a moment in the sales cycle where uh, your company might need to do a great big launch and you get to invite your most valuable customers there. There's all these different ways that these big sales moments happen and how you can lure them and keep them and avoid them from ghosting you. Mm-hmm. One of the most important things for a salesperson to keep in mind is they have a goal, right? And they're under pressure to hit the quota, pressure to hit the quota, pressure to hit their quota. So sometimes salespeople will um, approach the sales call as if I'm the hero. I'm going to snatch this thing from you so I can be rewarded at a parade of heroes at the end of my own movie. But in reality, that isn't how it's supposed to roll. In reality, you're supposed to be the humble mentor the careful listener, the one who understands what is their inner need, meaning what's driving their behavior and mindset and what's their outer need. How can my product actually bring a breakthrough? How can this product actually make them be unstuck? And it's really other centric mindset that the salespeople are supposed to show up with. It's not, it's not uh, like, it's not like they're big game hunting and they're going to shoot an arrow and impale the, you know, the, the, um, buyer and and land, bag a big one. I mean that whole mindset is should be like eradicated from from how salespeople work. So your product, your services are in service of helping your buyer get unstuck. And if you can't map out, oh wow, this is the persona, this is what they this is what they've signed up for online. I'm imagining that they're stuck like X, Y, Z. When I show up at the call, I'm going to make it look like I'm a magician and I'm just pulling these little insights up out of my pocket, right? And have that all handy so you can push the sales conversation along the best way you can um, by at least partially understanding who's showing up on the call. Mm. And you mentioned pulling insights out of your pocket there. and. (laughs) Uh, another one of your books that's fantastic is about data stories. Yeah. How should we be using data? I, I work in the world of IT. We use data in our pitches mm-hmm. all the time, and most of it bores the socks off our audiences. How can we use <laughs> data in more of an exciting and compelling way? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, I, if, if you imagine the spark line or, or the, or the length of a presentation, there's the contrast between what is and what could be, but you should also have analytical and emotional contrast. And a lot of people would say data should be neutral and it, and it is, and it should be, it can be neutrally and not emotionally charged, right? And you can just state a fact and people could be having a reaction to a stated fact. They could be like, whoa, like, I did not know that fact. And I'm blown away by that fact. But you can turn that fact into something that's a little has a layer of emotional charge to it. I hate to call it that, but that's what it does is by uh, stating the fact, you can also marvel at its magnitude. Like Steve Jobs Mm -hmm. was great at that. He's like, do you realize that, you know, we've had so much this is such old Apple history, but we've had so much traffic in our Apple store, we would be able to fill up 25 Mac worlds in the first week it opened or whatever was the stat, right? Yeah. But people are like, oh, I, 
wow, that's a lot of people, right? So like tying the, the, um, to marvel at the magnitude of the number, but you can also humanize the data. So you could talk about one of the humans that generated that data, <laughs> which salespeople generate data, employees generate data, customers generate data. You can humanize the data by talking about a pattern you found that of the human behavior in the data that generated the data points. Um, and then you talk about the human and the struggle that the humans behind that are generating the data are having. By generating the data, I mean, I mean, right now, everything is tracked that we do. Anytime you pick up your phone, anytime you walk from one room to the next, anytime you swipe left or swipe right, right? Uh, anytime you drive your car, data is being collected on you. Um, even at, at, as an employee, right? The days you have off, the days you, like, there's just so much that gets collected. And and so you got to understand when you find a pattern in the data, sometimes we disassociate them from the human beings. We just look at the data as a data set mm. and we plot it and we dig in it and we just, we don't have our empathy hat on when we're digging through it. We don't understand what were they thinking or feeling? Why, why did they make the decisions that is making this trajectory go up? Who are the ones making the decisions, making the trajectory go down? And how do we improve their life and their flourishing so that the data goes the direction we want? The only way to know to do that is to actually talk to the humans that generated the data and then influence them in a different direction by what they believe and how they behave. So that's the way to humanize it. And then when you present it, you can present data in a three-act structure also. So there's mm -hmm. all kinds of ways to incorporate um, data and storytelling and how you visualize it, what you make stand out, how you make your point clear, um, and then even how you verbalize it in the shape of a story. Um, and then when you're presenting it, you have time that you have. Mm -hmm. So you get to build a chart over time. Don't show the whole chart. If it has the surprise ending, like show the first few bars and then reveal, you know, reveal yeah. like, oh my God, standing ovation because <laughs> the data showed we hit our goal, you know, but so many people just put the whole chart up there and they have a moment where people are like, did we hit our goal? Did we not hit our goal? Oh my God, do we think we hit our goal? You build all the suspense. They don't know. They don't know. And then you show the final chart and yay, roaring applause. They hit their goal, right? I mean, but mo a lot of people just like, throw the chart up there yeah. <laughs> and they, and they could have had it this built the suspense and, and created that moment, but we just forget to sometimes. Yeah. Mm. I love that. Do you ever go beyond storytelling and slides in a presentation as in creating more immersive experiences, pitch theater as it were? Yeah, actually I'm, 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 trying to work on one right now, even for just myself. So there's moments, there's things you could do, right? Where you can do polls, have people pick up their phone, do word clouds. You know, there's these moments where you want to have people recognize that they're part of a larger um, audience and you may want to have the audience understand what each other thinks or feels or believes. And, you know, through polls, there's all kinds of ways to make things interactive. You can do things like create living infographics in a room, you know, like have, hey, if you're like this, that, that, or the other, go in these different corners. You can have people mm. um, do an empathy line where they step forward. If something's true, step back. If it's not, it all depends on the size or scale of, of your audience. There's all kinds of things you can do like that. Um, yeah. And then just um, stopping and the pausing in a certain moment and saying, hey, I just want to pause for a second and see is there anything I can do to clarify before I move on? Sometimes putting the Q&A right in the middle kind of reawakens right. the audience. Another thing you can do <clears throat> that more and more execs are doing, <clears throat> excuse me, is to be a curator instead of a speaker. So Chris Anderson doesn't speak himself at TED. He's not the speaker himself. He's the one who brings these great really powerful presenters onto a stage and more and more CEOs were having them do that, right? Where they'll stand up and have this person come up for five minutes, this person come up for four, this person come up for 10. And what happens is the novelty in your brain of a new voice, a new person mm. walking on stage, it triggers these parts of the brain through novelty. Oh, that person's done. Oh, a new person. And you get reawakened every time a new person walks on stage. It's like a, oh, ha, oh, okay. Something new is happening. So having something new happen um, helps keep people engaged and um, makes it visually and auditorially interactive in a sense, right? There's all kinds, there's all kinds of things. I, I like that with the CEO because it shows an element of sort of servant leadership as well. 
they don't, they're showing that, you know, these people who I'm bringing on stage have got a, a, even a bigger voice than mine. They know more about this stuff yeah. than me. It's, uh, yeah. Do you have a, a, a favorite experience that you have had on a speech or a presentation or a talk? One where you've thought, boy, that all went exactly better than I could have imagined. I think I, I loved uh, working with my coaches. So we do an annual meeting. It's our biggest meeting. And we do it actually during Dr. King week because um, it's our vision. It's like our I have a dream mm. speech for the company where we establish the vision. We break it down into goals and all that. And we also recap the previous year. And I had noticed that previous years when I thought we nailed it the previous year, I would deliver it, you know, in in the January of the next year. And people weren't clapping or laughing or excited or happy. You know, I was like, what's going on? Like I and so I wrote the next one and I hired, hired, used um one of my own coaches to say like She's like, well, tell me everywhere in your talk where you want someone to feel something. Okay. And so mm. we went through and I was like, okay, it would be nice if they were happy at their success for last year. And she was like, you know what, Nancy, I have been in that audience with you and I'm like so happy. And I just start to be like, oh, reacting to it and you move on too quickly. Ah. And so what you're going to do is pause and start to clap yourself. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's a good Jeez. idea. Yeah. Right. But then also she put in there places, like I was saying, like, if you flip the order of this, this would get a laugh. And if you do this, this is where they'll clap. Like it was really, it got really prescriptive. And it's interesting. We nail it. I mean, we have to, we're a presentation company. We nail, you know, it's going to be an hour long. And, and because the physical reaction in the audience went longer than I anticipated, I went over by five minutes. But what a great reason to go over five yeah. minutes is because the audience needed that time and space to feel all the feels and stuff. So my coaches are just world class, world class. And um, I think that's when I, I was most proud of that in the sense that I was like, oh my God, like, wow. Uh, yeah. I was not doing some things right. So I think it's because I grew a lot, uh, but sometimes I forget. I still use them. Um, I still use my own coaches. Well, I think it's a lot easier for someone else to come and look at you objectively with fresh eyes. Exactly. And this is the other reason why we should rehearse in front of people and get those opinions. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. So where can people find out more about oh. all of the amazing things that you do? <laughs> So website is Duarte.com. I'm up on Twitter at Nancy Duarte and at Duarte is the company. I'm really active, probably the most on LinkedIn myself, but we have a LinkedIn page. I have a LinkedIn page and the company has a LinkedIn page and uh, we're just kind of starting up our Insta over again, but we'll be up there and that's, that's where she rolls. All right. And for people listening, what, what do you think, what are your final words of wisdom? What are the most important lessons that you've learned through doing all of this stuff? You know what I think is like empathy. Empathy could cure most of the world's ills. And, you know, no leader is perfect at it. In fact, you know, someone recently reminded me I was not being very empathetic because I think sometimes we get caught up in the moment, caught up in what we need to get done or stay so focused as leaders that sometimes we need people in our lives that are like, oh, oh don't forget, <laughs> you know? And so I think empathy and I think being other centric, taking that moment before a call or before a meeting, reset your chemistry in your own body and be there the way the person that you're going to be with needs you to be there. It happened during COVID where, I don't know, I was out on the veranda dreaming about this new future, right? I have to do that even in the darkest time. You have to see the future so you can navigate out. So I was out there with my pen. I love my pen and paper and I was amped up, you know, and then I had to come into an employee meeting where everyone was like, needed me to be in solidarity with them, right? And people were blue or the fires in California, the sky was red. Like, I don't remember mm. what the situation was. I knew, like I paused and knew, I can't show up in this meeting all fired up about the future right. because this current present was just so dark for everyone. So it's stuff like that where you please be thoughtful about who you're going to speak with. Um, that's not my strength. Um, it's not my strength. And so that's why, that's why 
I built books about it. Mm. Uh, so I could transform myself as a leader and, and transform other leaders, frankly. And you, I do hear you at the end of your talks that you're so positive about how we can all change the world. Mm. What's your next plan to change the world? <laughs> we have a lot going on. In fact, yeah. so much going on. I, we're having to stack rank, stack rank and prioritize everything. Right. Um, but we have all kinds of stuff. I'm kind of doubling down right now on business storytelling because I have a, um, I have a model that I think uh, um, will really make a difference. And so I have at least one more or two more books and courses in me. We've spent a Good. lot of time grooming uh, my other experts. I'm definitely not the only expert and I'm definitely not the smartest. They say hire people smarter than yourself. And I did that. So we have new bodies of work coming from some of my experts. It's very exciting. And so you'll, you'll start to see more about like Duarte, the company, um, a little bit less from me, but um, I, I'm in it to win it. My passion's still strong. So You'll see. <laughs> Amazing. I cannot wait to see, hear, and watch anything that comes wow, you're so nice. into the world from you. Thank you so much for your time. It's so much appreciated. Uh, I love what you do, and um, it's been a pleasure. Well, I had a good time, Danny. Thanks for having me. This has been another episode of Pitch Masters. Go to pitchguy.co.uk for updates and information or search for Pitch Guy on social media for regular videos on sales, psychology, storytelling, creativity and much more. 